I'm Ranga Karnam. I'm Tenix certified in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud as well. Our courses are helping thousands of learners do their cloud certifications in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. Welcome to this video titled AWS Interview Questions and Answers. What we'll do in this video is we'll pick up one of the top Google search results when you search for AWS Interview Questions and Answers, and I'll try to answer the questions which are present in there. What we'll do is I'll also use one of the presentations of my earlier courses as a guide to ensure that we don't miss any point that is really, really important. Let's get started with answering a few AWS interview questions and answers. The first question in here is describe AWS in brief. Okay, this is kind of a very, very generic question, right? AWS in brief. Probably what I would recommend with each question is to, whenever you are asked about specific thing, I would like to actually give a big picture, a high level overview of it, and then get in deep with it, right? So whenever somebody asks, let's say about S3, then probably I would talk about object storage first and then explain the use case of object storage and then talk about S3 being the object storage service in AWS. Similar to that, if somebody is asking me about AWS, probably I would start with explaining what is cloud, why is cloud important, and then dig deeper into specifics about AWS. Right? If you look at the cloud, cloud has a number of advantages. So the main feature of cloud is on-demand resource provisioning. Get resources whenever you need them. Right? Earlier, um, before the cloud, businesses needed to procure infrastructure, put everything in place. And then, uh, like if you would want to increase the number of servers, you need to buy them again. The thing is, for this kind of thing, you need to go ahead and procure infrastructure ahead of time. You need to plan ahead and then procure infrastructure. However, when it goes to the cloud, it's on demand. Whenever you need it, you ask it and you get it. So you provision resources, you rent resources whenever you would want them and you release them back when you don't need, don't need them, right? So the biggest advantages of going for the cloud are that you don't really need to worry about capital expense. You don't need to invest money ahead of time. You would actually go for variable expense. Basically, you're paying rent over a period of time. And also you benefit from massive economies of scale. AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, all these cloud platforms are, are buying millions of servers. And therefore they can get it at a much cheaper price than you and me can get it at. So you can benefit from massive economies of scale that the cloud providers can benefit from. Stop guessing capacity. A lot of times it's very, very difficult to predict the future. A startup does not know how successful it would be. A specific application and enterprise is building. We don't know how successful it, we, it will be. So you don't really need to worry about uh, guessing capacity. As the number of users increase, you can request the, you can request resources on demand. And you don't really need to worry about uh, maintaining your data centers. And the biggest advantage I see of going for the cloud is that you can go global in minutes, right? If you are a startup in India, for example, and you'd want to set up regions across the world, earlier it was very, very difficult. But now each of the cloud providers provide you with regions and zones everywhere around the world. So you can easily deploy applications across the world and provide really great experience for all your users. So that's the benefit of cloud. And AWS, as we know, is the number one cloud service provider. It's, uh, it provides a lot of services. I would say the most number of services among all the cloud providers. And it's also proved to be reliable, secure, and cost effective. So I guess that should be more than sufficient uh, to uh, start with AWS in brief. And maybe you can take the take the discussion from there. Next, what is S3 in AWS? S3, right? S3 is object storage. Whenever we talk about storage at a high level, whenever we talk about a high level, we talk about block storage, we talk about file storage, and we talk about object storage. You go for block storage when you want to attach a hard disk with your VM, right? Something similar to your laptop. You have a hard disk attached to your laptop computer. If you want to do something similar in uh, AWS, you would go for elastic block store. That's how you would create uh, block storage in AWS. If you want to have uh, file storage, if you want to create a file share and share it between multiple virtual machines, that's when you would go for elastic file service, EFS. However, block storage, uh, sorry, the third one is object storage. The S3 over here 
simple storage service is an example of object storage. Let's quickly review some of the important things that you'd need to know about simple storage service. So as you can see in here, Amazon S3 is an example of object storage. Basically, you have a key value pair and you can update and download objects. You can upload and object download objects using the key value. So it's a very, very flexible thing, right? So the value can be anything. It can be any file. It can be a text file. It can be a binary file. It can be an image. It can be anything. So it provides you with a lot of flexibility. You can upload static HTML files or any kind of files. You can upload archive files. You can upload your database backup. Uh, you can upload staging data. So there are a wide variety of use cases where object storage is used in. And S3 is the object storage service in AWS. S3 provides you with a really good REST API that would allow you to update objects, sorry, update objects and download objects as well. And S3 provides you with unlimited storage. The storage just keeps scaling uh, with you, your usage, right? In S3, if you want to store objects, you need to first create a bucket. And inside the bucket, you can store as many objects as you would want. And as you keep adding uh, objects into the bucket, the bucket also scales. So you don't need to worry about storage at all. You can store unlimited objects in your bucket. And S3 provides you with 99.99% uh, availability with the default storage class. And it also provides 11 nines durability. And by default, objects are replicated in a single region. So if you are uploading an object, it is replicated automatically between multiple availability zones, which are present in a single region. And as we talked earlier, there are a number of use cases. You can store a variety of files when you are using S3. So that's kind of a quick overview of S3. Let's move on to the next one. Explain AMI in brief. From object storage, we are moving into virtual machines, right? So the virtual machine service in AWS is EC2, Elastic Compute Cloud. And the specific thing that we are referring to in here is AMI, Amazon machine image. What is Amazon machine image? Whenever I'm creating a virtual machine, whenever I create, even let's say I would want to create a laptop or a, I, mean, I would want to set up a laptop or I would want to set up a computer. The first thing that we would be thinking about is hardware and software. What is the hardware I would need? The second thing I would be thinking about is what is the OS? What is the software I would need on it? Uh, when we talk about hardware, uh, we would be talking about uh, like in, in the case of AWS, when we talk about hardware, it's instance family and instance type. When we talk about the OS and the software, it is the AMI, Amazon Machine Image. That is what helps you to choose the OS and the software. AMI is nothing but what OS and what software do you want on a specific instance. There are a variety of sources for getting your AMIs. There are some default AMIs which are provided by AWS. There is also a place called AWS Marketplace where you can go and use some of the some of the AMIs which are present in the marketplace. However, remember that these are not free. You would have a per hour billing for these AMIs. And you can also create your own AMIs depending on your need. If you'd want to harden your specific AMI, you might want to start with an AMI which is provided with AWS and customize it for your needs. And then you can create your own custom AMI and you can use it to create your EC2 instances. So AMIs typically contain at least the root volume. So you would have the root volume where your OS is uh, launched from. This is typically called the boot disk. And you'll also have the other storage devices. If you do have other uh, block storage devices that are attached, then you will have mappings for them as well. And these AMIs are stored in the object storage service in AWS, which is Amazon S3. It's very, very important for disaster recovery that you have up-to-date AMIs available in multiple regions. The reason is because even if one, if one region is down, then you can use the AMI, which is present in some other region, and you can launch up your EC2 instances. If a specific region is down, and if your AMI is in that specific region, then you would not be even able to launch EC2 instances in any other regions because you don't even have access to the AMI. You can avoid that by following this specific best practice. OK, that's the discussion about AMI. Let's move on to the next question. What are the key components of AWS? This is kind of a vague kind of a question, key components of AWS. 
CloudWatch, EBS, Route 53, they're talking about different services which are present in AWS, right? So S3 is the object storage service, EC2 is the virtual machine service, IAM is what you use to create users and give them permissions. Route 53 is to map a specific URL, uh, a specific website to a specific IP address, right? So you might be hosting a website on Elastic Beanstalk, and you would want to use www.in28minutes.com to host that website. You can configure www.in28minutes.com points to this Elastic Beanstalk instance. That's what Route 53 allows you to do. Elastic Block Store, as we discussed earlier, is the block storage. And CloudWatch is more for monitoring. If you want to get metrics and all that stuff, that's where we would go for CloudWatch. But I don't know really if this would be the right way for me to approach uh, that specific question. Right? If somebody is asking me for key components of AWS, probably I would be looking at answering uh, at a high level, right? So maybe I would go with trying to think about what are the different types of services which are offered in AWS. Probably I would say uh, in AWS, the important services would be compute, storage, database. Uh, I'd be talking about networking services, um, maybe some big data services, machine learning services, right? At a high security related services. So these would be the things I would touch upon at a high level and probably give an overview and probably clarify the expectation on what, like what, what the expectation on a specific question is. Now, let's go on to the next question. How can we send a request to Amazon S3? How can you send a request to Amazon S3? Maybe if you'd want to upload an object to S3, there are a number of ways you can do that, right? You can use the command line. Uh, you can use the management console, which is provided by AWS. You can use the SDK. If you are writing a program, you can make use of the SDK as well. So there are a variety of ways you can upload objects or you can interact with Amazon S3. Let's see if there is a little bit more information in here. So uh, if you look at over here, it says REST API is one way, um, AWS SDK, AWS CLI, and AWS Management Console. I think those are the ways you can access uh, S3. Let's see what is in here. Um, S3 is used for REST service, REST API, AWS SDK wrapper libraries, and also SDK wrapper. Cool. There are those are the approaches to talk to uh, S3. Okay. How many buckets can a user create in AWS by default? I don't know why it is important. I wouldn't even worry about reminding remembering it. It says about hundred bucket by defaults. Not really worried about it. Uh, what are the possible? Oops. Uh, let's actually go a little uh, higher. I'm kind of missing some questions. Yep. So explain T2 instance in brief. Uh, T2. Let's see if we have instance types in here. T2. A T2 is one of the instance types which is offered by EC2. Earlier we talked about whenever you choose, whenever you want to create a virtual machine, whenever you want to create an EC2 instance, you need to choose the hardware and the software. The hardware is where you choose the instance type. An instance type is nothing but a specific optimized combination of compute, memory, disk, and networking. What do I mean? Right? There are different types of workloads. There might be general purpose workloads, which might need a balance between CPU, memory, disk, and networking. There might be specific compute optimized workloads where you are doing a lot of high performance computing. In those kind of situations, you would need high CPU. You need a lot of CPU, but you don't need that much memory. And there might be situations where you would want to run a database or NoSQL database or a data warehouse where the IO speed is very, very important. Storage, they should be storage optimized. There, you might also be running some graphics processing. In those kind of situations, you would want a GPU attached. So they should be optimized for GPU. So there are different types of families, instance types that are provided by EC2 service. And among these, one of them is T, right? So the first one is M, which is general purpose. Uh, T is burstable performance instances. Uh, typically, you would use T to run web servers, development environments, and small databases. The advantage here is they are burstable. Let's say I don't have any load for a little while, and suddenly there is a jump, and th suddenly there is a lot of load which is coming in to my application. In those kind of situations, these T2 instances are recommended because they accumulate CPU credits when inactive. So during the period when they are not making use of the CPU, they accumulate credits. And when there is a sudden burst, you can make use of those credits. So if you have uh, very, very small applications, small web servers, development environments are good examples, right? Typically, development environments 
are idle for most part. And suddenly you would have a testing team or a development team testing it for a little while, and then it would be idle as well. So for those kind of situations, uh, burstable instances would be recommended. That's kind of T2. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Which subnet is used to launch a database server in VPC with private and sub public subnets? Okay, let me try and understand the question first. I have a VPC with a private and public subnet. Where will you launch a database server? Right. So the concept you need to understand in here are the concept of a VPC, the concept of a subnet, what is a private subnet, public subnet, and then you need to choose where you would launch your database server. Right. So why do you need a virtual private cloud or a VPC? Let's quickly review that right now. So I'll actually say virtual private cloud. I think this is where our VPC nodes would be. So basically, a VPC is nothing but your isolated network in the AWS world. What do I mean by that? Basically, whenever you have applications in a data center talking to each other, nothing outside your data center will be able to see what is going on inside your specific data center. However, in the cloud, we are making use of shared infrastructure. There might be uh, in the same data center, there might be applications, there might be resources related to multiple enterprises. And that's why you need to be really, really careful about networking in the cloud. Uh, when you create a VPC and you create resources within the VPC, the communication between those resources is not available outside the VPC. And you can control the traffic which is coming into the VPC and traffic which is going out of the VPC. So that's the reason why the best practice in AWS is to create everything in a VPC. Now, why do you need subnets? Whenever we talk about VPC, we create different kinds of resources. There might be a database, there might be a web server, there might be an EC2 instance, there might be a HTTP server. So there are a lot of resources. Some of these resources are private. For example, your database, you don't want to allow access from outside. However, when it comes to, let's say, a HTTP server or a load balancer, you'd want people from outside to be able to access it. From internet, you'd want to be able to send a request to the load balancer. And from load balancer, the request goes to the EC2 instance. And the EC2, from the EC2 instance, the request goes to the database. So your load balancer must be a public resource. Your EC2 instance and the database don't need to be a public resource. So that's where subnets come into picture. You want to separate private from public. All the public resources you would put in one subnet and you'll make sure that it's a public subnet. It has a route from the internet. However, all the things which are private, like a database, you'd put it in a private subnet. So something like a database, you would want to ideally create it within a private subnet. So that's the answer. So which subnet would be used to launch a database server? Because database server, you'd want to keep it private. You don't want to allow public access to it. You'd create it in a private subnet. OK, explain the use of buffer in Amazon Web Services. This is, again, a kind of a different question. Explain the use of buffer. Manage traffic by synchronizing different components. Requests are received and proceeded in unbalanced way by elements. I am not really sure. Maybe they're talking about queues in here. If you're talking about queues in AWS, probably uh, SQS, or if you want uh, asynchronous kind of a thing, probably uh, SQS would be the best bet uh, in AWS. OK, let's move on to key pairs. Explain key pairs in AWS. Key pairs, where do we use key pairs? Key pairs are used with EC2 instances, right? Whenever you would want to authenticate yourself to an EC2 instance, you want to SSH into an EC2 instance, that's when you'd make use of the key pair, right? EC2 uses something called public key cryptography. There is something called a public key. There is something called a private key. And the public key is stored in the EC2 instance. And the private key is given to you when you create the EC2 instance. Whenever you create an EC2 instance, you can actually download the private key, which is uh, present. And this public key and the private key are what are called key pairs. Whenever you want to SSH into the EC2 instance, you need to use the private key and login. So typically, the important things that you would need to ensure is that private key should be kept secure. Anybody who has access to the private key will be able to access your EC2 instance. So you need to be really, really careful with it. And also, the change, the permissions should be 0400. So on the key, make sure that you change the permissions to 0400. And in the case of Windows instance, you also need an admin password. Just the private key is not sufficient. You 
create a like when a EC2 instance for Windows is created, you will also need to create an admin password along with it. So those are the things which would be important. And whenever you connect to an EC2 instance, you should make sure that your EC2 instance, if you want to SSH into it, the security group that is attached with your EC2 instance should allow SSH access. So if you are using Linux and doing SSH, port 22. If you are doing RDP, if you are creating a Windows instance, you are doing an RDP in those kinds of situations, this is what should be allowed. So yeah, that's kind of a high level overview of uh, the key pairs. Now let's move on and list the different types of instances. I guess they're talking about EC2 instance types. That's what we looked at earlier as well. Instance. It's, so we looked at earlier M, T, C, R, I, G. Uh, M is general purpose. T is burstable performance instances. C is compute optimized. So for batch processing, high, high performance computing. R is memory optimized, RAM optimized. These are for memory caches, in-memory databases, and things like that. And I is for storage optimized. Uh, typically, you'd go for storage optimized if there's a lot of I.O. which is going on. If you're reading a lot from the disk, typically no SQL databases, data warehousing, batch workloads. These are the places where you'd want I.O. optimized things, right? So uh, G is GPU optimized. So if you are doing floating point calculations, graphics processing, or video compression, that's when you would go for uh, GPU optimized things. So yeah, that's kind of a high level overview on the instance types. How many elastic IPs are you allowed to create for each AWS account? And when was EC2 officially launched? Um, interesting question, right? Uh, five VPC elastic, five VPC elastic IP addresses are permitted for each AWS account. And it was launched in 2006, right? So more than that, I think it's important to understand what is an elastic IP, right? Whenever we talk about uh, EC2 instances, uh, we also talk about IP addresses. You'd want to be able to access the IP, uh, like EC2 instance. And therefore, you'd need an IP address to be able to access it. And there are two kinds of IP addresses that you can associate with your EC2 instance, public and private. De by default, every EC2 instance which you create is given a private IP address. So inside a VPC, your EC2 instance is always having a private address. And you can choose if you want to assign a public IP address. If you assign a public IP address to your EC2 instance, your EC2 instance will be accessible from the internet. However, the problem with the public IC, uh, like public IP address is the fact that when you restart a EC2 instance, the public IP address changes. It, it is lost and you might get a new public IP address. So each time I restart, I might get a new IP address, which is not sometimes what you want. Right? If you are actually giving the IP address to somebody else to access a specific application on an EC2 instance, which is not recommended, but which is done a few times when you'd want to quickly test something. Uh, in those kind of situations, you don't want the public IP to change. How do you ensure that the public IP does not change? That's where you would go for elastic IP. Elastic IP is a quick and dirty approach to get a static IP address. Right? Why am I calling it a quick and dirty approach? Because the recommended approach would be to create a load balancer and use the load balancer IP address and load, use the load balancer to load balance between the EC2 instances. However, there might be situations where like I'm quickly creating something for a quick test or something of that kind. In those kind of situations, I might directly give the URL of an EC2 instance and those kind of situations, Elastic IP might be a good thing to use. So that's about Elastic IP. Uh, one important thing you have to need to remember about Elastic IP is the fact that you're built for it when you are not using it. So if you create an Elastic IP and you don't attach it with an EC2 instance, that's when you will be built for it. If your Elastic IP is attached with an EC2 instance and it's running, no problem. But when you are not using it is when you will be built for it. That's kind of a very, very different thing. Usually you would be built for something when you're using it, However, with the Elastic IP addresses, it's a little different, right? So let's move on. What is the default storage class in simple storage device S3? Actually, it's not simple storage device. It's actually simple storage service. But anyway, let's talk about storage classes which are present in S3. There are a variety of storage classes which are present in S3. The reason why storage classes are important is because as we talked earlier, S3 can hold different kinds of data. Some data you'd want to immediately access, some data might be archived. So 
for the data which is stored in AWS, there are huge variations in access patterns. And some data I would want to get immediately, right? So when I need it, I would want to immediately need it. There might be certain data like archives. Uh, when I need it, I might have a 24 hour notice or a 48 hour notice. There is no urgency to access that. So is, S3 provides you trade offs between access time and cost. So S3 tells if you want to immediately access data, then you need to pay me high, high amount, right? However, if you need data after 12 hours or 24 hours, then you need to pay me less, right? So that's why there are these storage classes. So that's why uh, these storage classes are basically things which will enable you to optimize your costs while still meeting your access time needs. Let's quickly look at the different storage classes which are present uh, in AWS. Uh, the default is standard. This is for frequently accessed data, and it is distributed in three different availability zones, at least three availability zones. Standard IA is for long-lived, infrequently accessed data. If you want to create a backup for disaster recovery, that's when you would create something with a storage class of standard IA. Again, more than three uh, availability zones. So it's standard, infrequent access. One zone IA is for long-lived, infrequently accessed non-critical data that's the most important part why is it non-critical data why why should you only store non-critical data in here because it is one zone this data will be only stored in one availability zone standard and standard io will be stored in at least three availability zones in the case of one zone ia the data is stored in just one zone that means you might lose it if that zone goes down or something something bad happens in that specific place where you're storing that specific data. So you should use it for non-critical data, which is easily recreatable. For example, if you're storing thumbnail for images, you can easily recreate thumbnails when needed if you lose that. Right. So those kind of data you can store with one zone IA. Intelligent tiring is basically telling S3, I don't know how will how I'll access it. You decide. You make sure that my costs go down. However, you decide, uh, like you, you decide uh, the path, I mean, where you want to store it. Last ones are related to Glacier, right? Glacier is basically an archive kind of a thing. Basically, uh, the data in Glacier is replicated to three places. However, your access time will be ranging from minutes to hours. You cannot say I immediately need this specific file. The, you first put a request, and then within a few minutes or an hour, you get access to that specific object. And if you are OK with a lead time of an hour or more, a few hours, in those kind of situations, you can go for Glacier Deep Archive. The last one, reduced redundancy, is not recommended anymore. Here's a quick comparison between the different storage classes. You can see that standard IA has the least amount of availability along with intelligent tiring. Right? These have the least amount of availability. And standard Glacier and Glacier Deep Archive have the highest amount of availability. And uh, in terms of replication, you'd see that one zone IA is only replicated in one availability zone. All the others are replicated in at least three availability zones. Uh, in terms of the first byte access, uh, how fast can you access a specific file which is present in S3? You'd see that the first four have millisecond response times. However, Glacier and Glacier Deep Archive are much slower. Minutes or hours for Glacier, few hours for Glacier Deep Archive. And there is a minimum object size that you will be built for uh, in the case of standard one zone Glacier and Glacier Deep Archive. Even if you are storing an object which is less than this size, you will be built for that amount. And there are also minimum amount of storage days present. So if you store an object, uh, in intelligent tiring, you'll be built for a minimum of 30 days. Even if you are storing it only for three, four days, you'll be built for 30 days. That's the minimum storage days. And you can see that the cost is the least for Glacier Deep Archive. So per GB cost, the storage cost uh, will be least for the archive tire. And the storage cost is the highest for the standard tire. The storage cost is just a representative thing. It's not the exact number. It can change from region to region, time to time. So it's not really uh, the same across. And encryption is mandatory for both the Glacier things. Encryption is not mandatory for all the others, except for Glacier and Glacier Deep Archive. 
So that's basically the storage types, which are storage classes, which are present in S3. The next question is what are possible connection issues user might face while connecting to an instance, right? If you are connecting to an EC2 instance, you might have a bad network. So you might get a timeout. Um, the second thing is you might not have the right key. So you might get an authentication error or something. Uh, the other thing which can happen is the security group might not allow uh, access into it. So if your security group is not configured to allow your access, then it might not allow uh, access from uh, your IP or from your specific, or, or you might not be able to access a specific port on the EC2 instance. I guess those would be some of the important ones. Now, the next one is edge locations. Explain edge locations in brief. Um, edge locations is something which comes into picture when we talk about CloudFront. Let's quickly search for edge location. Okay. So basically, if you look at uh, AWS, AWS provides about 25, around 25 to 30 regions in around the world, right? But if you look at the edge regions, the edge regions are edge locations, actually. Edge, there are much more number of edge locations. So there are 200 plus edge locations around the world. Why? Why is it important? The most important reason for edge locations is low latency. Let's say a user is in US. And if I'm serving HTML content or static content from India, right? He needs to go, his request needs to travel from US to India and then the response is sent back. So it will be slow. You'll get high latency. However, if you want low latency, what you can do is you can have a server nearby him, nearby your user directly in US. And if your content is directly in that specific location, then it's faster. That kind of locations are what are called edge locations. AWS has edge locations in 200 different locations around the world. Whenever a user sends a request, most probably he would be served from the nearest edge location. Now, the question is, how do you distribute the content to the edge locations, right? So let's say I have a HTML file or static content or some kind of content. How do you ensure that the content is distributed across to all the edge locations around the world, right? That's what Amazon CloudFront allows you to do. Amazon CloudFront, helps you to take content from S3, EC2, ELB, and external websites, and it helps you to distribute it around the world. Let's move on. Uh, what is VPC in AWS? We already talked about VPC, virtual private cloud. Uh, you want to separate out your own, your traffic between resources should not be visible outside to other, uh, like because AWS is a shared infrastructure, you don't want your traffic to be visible to other uh, resources from other enterprises. That's why you would create a VPC. Once your resources are inside the VPC, the communication within that is private. It is not visible outside the VPC. And also you can control traffic, which is going in and out of the VPC. And you can further control uh, traffic going in, traffic going out by creating subnets. And there are things like internet gateways. Uh, there are things like NAT gateways and a lot of things that you can create to control what kind of traffic is allowed inside your instances and outside your instances. Explain Snowball in brief. Snowball is a device which is used to transfer data into AWS, right? So let's say I have a lot of data that I would want to uh, transfer or migrate from my, uh, from my data center to cloud. That's when I can go for Snowball. When you'd want to transfer terabytes or petabytes of data from on-premises. What you can do is you can request for a snowball device. You can copy data onto it and ship it back to AWS. And once the data is loaded, it is available in S3 for you. So uh, it's uh, like the, you need to uh, like to make a decision if you'd want to use uh, snowball or not. You can look at the specific utilization, right? So uh, if direct transfer, if you are transferring data. And if the direct transfer using a network connection takes more than a week, that's the situation in which you would typically go for Snowball. Uh, there are also Snowball tracks uh, if you want to transfer even much more. Like if you want to transfer from dozen petabytes to exabytes, uh, then you can go for Snowball trucks as well. So that's Snowball for you. Um, let's go on to Redshift. Uh, what's Redshift? Uh, this is the first database that we are talking about. That's surprising. For me, databases should have been much more frequent. We should have discussed a lot more about databases until now. But anyway, Redshift, 
let's search for Amazon Redshift. What is Amazon Redshift used for? Amazon Redshift is relational database for online analytical processing use cases. Whenever we talk about relational databases, they can be used for two things. One is online transaction processing, a banking transaction, which like a banking application, for example, allows credit, debit, like transfer to somebody, somebody, like all the basic operations that we do day, day in, day out. Right? That's a banking application. That's an OLTP application. However, the same banking, same bank might be running batch applications in the background. They would want to analyze the data and find out trends. They would want to uh, do batch operations on the data. Those kind of workloads are called online analytical processing workloads. The Redshift is used for online analytical processing. This is like a data warehouse, right? So a data warehouse where you can analyze petabytes of data. Typical terminology which is used in case of uh, data warehouse is things like ETL, extract transform load, or ELT, extract load transform, business intelligence. Those are the use cases where you would go for Redshift. Uh, if you'd want to do huge loading of like, whenever you'd want to do data warehousing, you'd want to be able to load data in, huge volumes of data in, and you'd want to be able to generate reports. That's why Redshift integrates really, really well with a lot of data loading tools, with reporting tools, with data mining tools, and analytics tools as well. So, uh, and another thing is uh, Redshift also allows you querying in a very, very efficient way. So once you store the data in Redshift, you can use massive parallel processing or MPP. You can create a cluster and you can use that to query. You can split the queries that you'd want to do across data, across multiple nodes. Thereby, you can get quick responses to your query. So Redshift is nothing but a data warehouse where you can store huge volumes of data and you can execute queries against that data to process it and get intelligence. Next question is, what are the advantages of auto-scaling? This is kind of a vague kind of a question. Um, advantages of auto-scaling, whenever you have a lot of EC2 instances, you want to be able to control how many EC2 instances are running. Let's say my load varies, right? So I need to be able to increase the number of instances or decrease the number of instances based on the load, based on the number of users who are using the application. This is what is called auto-scaling. And if you'd want to do auto-scaling, the way you can do auto-scaling in AWS, if you're using EC2 instances, is to use something called an auto-scaling group. An auto-scaling group allows you to scale out and scale in automatically. Basically, you can say, this is the minimum amount of size. So I would want to have minimum one instance or 10 instances. And you can say desired capacity. I would want to start off with three instances. And based on the requests which are coming in, I would want to be able to scale up to a maximum size. You can say the minimum size is one instance, the maximum size is 20 instances, and the desired size, for example, is three instances. In that kind of situation, you'd start with three instances, and based on the requests which are coming in, based on the metrics which the load balancer sees, which the auto scaling group sees, it would basically increase the number of instances or decrease the number of instances. However, minimum there would be one instance, the maximum can be 20 instances only. So that's what uh, auto scaling group allows you to do. It helps you to manage a configured number of instances and auto scale to adjust to the load. To an auto scaling group, you can also configure a health check. You can say this is the health check. And if the health check fails, replace the instance. So if a EC2 instance fails the health check, then that would be killed and it would be replaced with a new instance. So that's the important things about auto scaling group. Auto scaling is very, very important in the cloud. That's one of the main reasons why you go to the cloud, right? You want to be able to dynamically provision resources. So yeah, what do you mean by subnet and how many subnets can a user have per VPC? I think the we already talked about subnets, right? So we talked about the fact that in a VPC, you can have a private subnet, a public subnet, you can have multiple subnets actually. And it says over here that you can have about 200 subnets per VPC. Okay, cool. Uh, enlist the types of AMI provided by AWS. Again, a vague question, types of AMIs. There are, we already saw that there are variety of uh, Amazon machine. We already saw that there are three sources for AMIs, right? One is provided by AWS. One is you can buy them on AWS Marketplace or you can create them for yourself. And there would be variety of AMIs present, right? So if you want to run Linux, there's an AMI. And even within Linux, there would be a number of AMIs based on the software which is present on it. 
and they would be AMS for other operating systems as well, Windows, for example, Mac, I guess. So there would be different AMIs. I'm not really sure what they mean by types of AMIs. So let's not really worry about it. Enlist the DB engines, which can be used in AWS RDS. Finally, we are back to uh, RDS. Uh, AWS RDS is the service which you can use to create online transactional processing databases and relational databases. Service. Okay. This is managed uh, relational database service for OLTP use cases. By relational databases, we mean tables, foreign keys, indexes, uh, strong transactions, strong consistency. These are some of the features of any relational database, right? If you want to have an online transaction processing application, right, a banking application to perform transactions, right? So these are online transaction processing use cases. Typically, we would talk about MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server. Uh, this would be typical uh, OLTP relational databases. And in AWS, if you want to create any of these, you need to go for Amazon RDS. This is called the relational database service. And the database engines which are supported are Amazon Aurora, PostgreSQL, MySQL, MariaDB, Oracle Database, and Microsoft SQL Server. The, some of the important features that RDS provides for all these database engines, right? These are all called the database engines. Uh, and for all the database engines, you have multi-AZ deployment. Basically, uh, you can create a standby in another availability zone. So if you have your database instance in one zone, you can create a standby in another zone. So that if this database instance goes down, you can start serving the users from the other instance. You can create read replicas. If you have reporting applications, you don't want to run them against the transactional database. You might want to create a read replica for the database and, uh, and generate reports from your read replica. You can also storage. Uh, these databases can scale up to limit. Typically, it's 64 TB. Up to 64 DB, you can configure auto scaling so that the database storage is increased based on your needs. Uh, you can also do automated backups. You can say, I would want to take uh, backups uh, at these intervals, and RDS can take that for you. And it can also do restore to point in time. So typically, the limit is seven days. So to any point in the last seven days, you can restore the database back to. So if you think there are transactions which happened in the last one hour, which corrupted the database, and I would want to revert it back to, let's say, one hour back, you can do that by using the restore to point in time feature. And you can obviously take manual snapshots whenever you'd want. Whenever you want a copy of the database, you can take a snapshot. So that's RDS for you. Uh, let's move on to other stuff which is present in here. Uh, explain Amazon EMR in Brief, right? Uh, again, this is kind of a database, or uh, this is Hadoop, actually, big data, right? So Amazon EMR is uh, like the managed service for Hadoop in AWS. Uh, let's quickly look at the data I have in here. So it's managed Hadoop. Uh, it helps you to do large-scale data processing with high customization, right? If you want to write complex programs, in Redshift, you can write queries and things like that. But if you want to do machine learning algorithms, if you want to uh, do complex analytics on huge volumes of data, right? That's when you'd go for uh, Amazon EMR. Um, there are a lot of tools that are associated typically with the Hadoop ecosystem, Pig, Hive, Spark, Presto. All of them are supported by Amazon EMR. OK, uh, explain the important features of Amazon Cloud Search in brief. This is the first time actually I'm hearing about Amazon Cloud Search. Uh, it says Boolean searches, prefix searches, uh, range searches, entire text search, autocomplete. Maybe this is a service to do um, if you'd want to incorporate search as part of your application. Maybe that's the service, Amazon Cloud Search. Um, Enlist the storage class available in Amazon S3. We already talked about storage classes in Amazon S3. OK, I guess that's basically it. Uh, these are like. Over this on this website, they are called the top 25 AWS interview questions, whatever. Right? The idea was to just quickly go over these questions and give you an overview of that specific service uh, related to that. Uh, one of the things I'm not sure is if this kind of videos are useful for you. If these kind of if you think these kind of videos are useful, help you in some way, then do let us know in the comments. Uh, and we would make sure that we would create more content like this. Uh, this is kind of a random content for me. Like, I just wanted to try if this is kind of content which would be appealing to you. If you find it interesting, do leave a comment. And that would give us feedback that 
you are interested and maybe you would be interested in creating more content like this. I'm sure you had a great time watching this video. Uh, if you like this video and the approach we used in this specific video, you would also be interested in our cloud certification courses. I am 10x certified in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. So we offer actually AWS certifications, uh, cloud practitioner, we offer developer associate, architect associate. We also have GCP certifications, cloud digital leader. Uh, we have uh, cloud uh, associate cloud engineer certification, associate or actually professional cloud architect. And we also have the professional cloud developer certification. And in Azure, we have all the fundamentals, AZ900, DP900, and AI900. So I would recommend you to try them out. And hopefully, I'll see you again. I'm sure you had a great time watching this video. Do not keep it to yourself. Tell your friends and tell YouTube as well. How do you do that? Like, share, and subscribe. If you're looking to get cloud certified, check out our cloud certification courses in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. And do not forget to check out the other videos in this series of videos on cloud fundamentals. If there is a cloud topic that you're feeling it's very, very difficult to understand, do post it in the comments and we will make it simple for you. I'm sure you had a great time watching this video and I'll see you again very, very soon. Until then, here's bye from Ranga at In28 Minutes. See you soon.